title is Contextualizing Socio-Legal Problems of Sudanese Youth in Malaysia, a case study. It's simply a case study. And uh, it's, it's something that I lived it. It's something I, I, I lived it. And uh, the research itself is a very simple one in which I went, I did an interview, interviews and uh, I met the students. And for your information, I've been there for 25 years in Malaysia. And actually every single problem uh, by the students or with the students or to the students or youth or even the Sudanese communities, they come to me simply because uh, I'm the legal something there. So always when they get into law, legal problems, they, they, they come to me. And as a matter of fact, I am the chair as well of the consultative uh, uh, community for the Sudanese community. So that's why I'm always there. Now, coming back, this is uh, generally the introduction, conceptual background, methodology, data collection, demographic profile of the, of the respondents, results and analysis, perception and understanding of Malaysian society, cultural integration. Yes, it still go on. Uh, marriage, food, friends, language, social challenges, individual safety, voluntary community service, public safety, racial tens tensions and slurs, uh, polycopobia, uh, cyber crimes and bullying conclusion. Don't worry, I'm not going to f touch on all that. So uh, the, 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 the slides you have, they are just skimmy. And if you really want to know more about the problems, there are actually a lot of problems that Sudanese youth are suffering in Malaysia. And I remember uh, Prof. Alam, when he read it, he said, I never knew that there are such huge problems suffered by the Sudanese youth. Anyway, um, why study Sudanese youth in diaspora? Um, we have common problems. And we thought if we know about these problems, we might learn lessons to advise the local authorities in Malaysia, for example, advise the parents, advise the embassies, and the students themselves. Because one of the issues, you, you, if you want to solve the problem, you have to go to the root causes. And there is no way at all to go to root causes unless you study the thing on the ground. So my study is very, very empirical. It is a problem which we learned it, we lived it. And you will find very little theoretical background. It's not a theory. I'm not trying to develop a theory. It is a practical kind of a thing. Just trying to report what, was, what is there. Whatever theories you find there, it just brought in order to explain some of the uh, trends that we experience with these students. Uh, the students in general, in general, they are exposed to new challenges, a number of challenges, and all of them almost, they have the same problems. I mean, whether you are a student, whether you are a youth who is just passing by, whether you come for work, or whatever reasons you come to Malaysia, they share the problems. But of course, it's a question of degree. How long you've been there? How long you intend to be there? What kind of things that you are involved? Are you a student proper? Or you are working? Or you came hunting for job? So in whatever capacity you are there, you share the problems. We have different students uh, or youth who come to Malaysia for different reasons. And with that reasons as well, they have different issues and different problems. Now, the kind of common problems that are shared by most youth in, 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 in there are the study problems, problems with society itself, and with the law. And this is by far the most difficult issues that most students, they come to, to, to suffer with. This case study is better understood by these problems in social legal context in Malaysia. Well, whatever problems that are there, unless you contextualize it, it becomes really extremely difficult to appreciate the nature of the problems. So that's why I thought 
it should be understood within its socio-legal problems in Malaysia. Malaysia actually is not, as people think, heaven on earth. I mean, most Sudanese, they believe that Malaysia is something wonderful. It is wonderful indeed, but it has its own problems. And for us who go, I mean, anybody else who goes to live in a different country, definitely you, are, you, you, you come through a lot of problems, whether with the society, whether with the system, or sometimes with yourself. And this is what we can discover. We will notice that some of the problems here are created by the students themselves rather than by the society, on the other hand. Now, the, this is a qualitative uh, method. Questionnaires, interviews were conducted. And, and the, a lot of majority there, you will find the participant observation. Being a part of the society, being, being there for a very long period and being part of the Sudanese community and being as a consultant, legal consultant, I have to observe. So as a participant observer, I have a lot of my input because I learned also from these kind of things. Yes? Lovely, I got the trick. Um, the Sudanese community in Malaysia, they are part and parcel of African youth in the greater Southeast Asia. Now, some carry Sudanese. Now, you could see the Sudanese youth who come to study. You will find some of them, they have Sudanese passports, but they've never been to Sudan, less lived there for any extended periods of time. Uh, one of the very interesting things, if you really want to identify the Sudanese youth there, you will discover that, I mean, normally we say we are Sudanese and um, we have certain common features, whether we like it or not. It's very easy to, to tell whether this is a Somali or a Nigerian or an Ethiopian or, 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 or a Sudanese because just taking a little bit background, their cultural background, the mannerisms, the way people do things, I mean, it can tell very much that this is a Sudanese, or that's a Nigerian, and so and so. But in overall, I mean, the features are more or less the same. I mean, uh, for, for the last 25 years, all my friends, majority of them, if not all, they call me a Nigerian. I mean, I mean it's, it's very interesting. Of course, I don't protest because a Nigerian. Yeah, a Nigerian a Sudanese is more or less the same, you know. So for me, I welcome it. But sometimes you feel it bad that someone you've been working with for the last 20 years, he doesn't even care to know where you're from. I mean, this is what hurts. Not because I was called Nigerian. And not only that, you tell him 100 times that, hey, I'm a Sudanese. <laughs> then after two weeks or three, hey, are you from Nigeria? I mean. Yeah, I, say, I don't mind to be from Nigeria, but I'm not from Nigeria anyway. But that's, that's the problem, you know. So uh, you could see, if, if someone is a professor, and if being always bombarded with this kind of a thing, what about a student? I mean, you can imagine the kind of dilemma they are living in, you know. So um, the uh, different backgrounds are really very important. Why I thought to bring these different backgrounds of the students to help us to really understand what are the cultural makeup of their attitudes when they come to study in Malaysia, for example. And this is really very interesting because that affects very much the way they study, the way they, they, they fare up, whether they fare up good or bad. I mean, this affects, although this is not a 100% determinant factor that will tell us whether students are going to do well or not well. And why I'm talking always to student students, because the majority of the Sudanese there, I mean, I mean, Sudanese community in Malaysia is a little bit, is, is a wonderful community because the majority of them, they are either university professors or students, few of them undergraduate. I mean, of lately it's increased undergraduate and the majority are postgraduates, you know. And uh, that's why it is always those who come there, they believe that the, uh, the, the Sudanese community in Malaysia is an elitist, educated community. I mean, it's not 100% true, but it is in the majority of the case. 
Now, you, you could find that, uh, the, especially of lately, quite a good number of these students, they come from, uh, they were settled from families that are actually settled either in Saudi Arabia or in the Gulf countries. Now, uh, you could easily imagine that students who are coming from these places to Malaysia, why they are faced or they come across quite a terrible experience within the Malaysian society. Now, coming back from all these countries as well, you remember or you know that these countries, they have their own problems. I mean, imagine a Sudanese youth or youngster who is, who is Sudanese by name. He carries a Sudanese uh, nationality or Sudanese passport, but he's been born and raised up, brought up in Saudi, either in Saudi Arabia or in any one of the Gulf countries. Now, you could tell, I mean, even the greater Sudan, I mean, I mean, I don't know whether I should say, say shame of us or not. Half of Khartoum is turned up to, not Khartoum, not Khartoum, a bigger part of Iraq, not Iraq, I mean, Saudi Arabia, Al-Taif, al I mean, you go on, you go on, and you can tell. Now, you could see that even we, the elders, we bring this back to Sudan. What about those who are born there? How do you expect them to react from this kind of a thing? Now, they bring certain mannerisms from these societies, which definitely we know they have their own endemic problems. And it's, it's not only us. I mean, these Sudanese youth who come to Malaysia, they do not come with the Sudanese problems. They multiply this, Sudanese plus, 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 plus Saudi Arabia. And as, uh, as uh, one of the professors was mentioning, Shalali, and I think you as well, you know, they, they work, start working in, in, Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, they shift to, 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 to the Gulf, or come to Malaysia, go back there, and you could imagine their children are moving around until the age of I mean, I mean, they graduate from the university, and if they are somehow, I don't know, lucky or unlucky, they come and move to Britain, and they study, they finish whatever their studies in, in UK here. Yeah. And you can imagine how many cultures, how many things that they come across, and they accumulate. And this is where most of them, they lose their identity. Now, okay, coming back. Uh, they acquire a hybrid culture as diasporic, I mean youth. Uh, when they come, as a matter of one of the most serious problems suffered is the transition period. I mean, those who come to study there, they have actually a real problem particularly to adapt to the Malaysian society. Uh, the Malaysian society is a little bit coish and a timid and a little bit reserved kind of a society, which is, although they are, I'm not saying that they do not accept the, 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 the foreigners or they do not accept the expatriates or whatever, but they have their own uniqueness, like, like any other society, like any other society. But to tell you the truth, there is, I mean, uh, Professor Sadiq is here, there is a little bit hypersensitivity against Africans. And you will see that the very fact you are an African, and especially a Nigerian, <laughs> you are in trouble. <laughs> and, and you can imagine I am in trouble because I'm classified as a Nigerian. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And, and, and this, is, this is the kind of a thing. I am a Nigerian. I don't mind at all. That's beautiful. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's lovely. So, um, so the, 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 the social climate in Malaysia is not always conducive, as people think it is. I mean, I mean, you could come, on the face of it, everything is nice. Lovely weather, rains all over, and particularly those who, who fast Ramadan there, they will enjoy to be there. But just go, I, I remember, just tell you a little story. I, I had my students, two friendly girls, they came to me and said, Prof, how do you find Malaysia? I said, wonderful. It's nice. People are nice. But then they looked at each other and then they smiled. I said, what is the problem? I said, Prof, have you been out to Kuala Lumpur? I said, no. Have you been to a nightclub? I said, no. Have you been to everything? I said, no, no, no. Then they laughed. You are outside the society. 
I think they were completely right. I lived outside the society. So if you really want to test it, if you really want to be in there, be in the society. And to be in the society, it's not just enough to mingle around. You have to mingle and go one step further. Maybe for my age and for my weather, I, I doubt if I can go that one step further. But the students, and this is where the problem is, the students actually, they are daring and they go that step further. And that's where they get into trouble. And this is the real problem. If you take your, I mean, if, if you reserve, you protect yourself and you are some, you can really live very nice in Malaysia. But if you overstep your, I think you will be in a really hell of a trouble. Okay. Um, some of them, maybe they come from a very reserved. And this is also very interesting. Some of these students, youth, when they come to Malaysia, they find themselves their freedom away from their parents, away from their khalo or khalo, all these kind of things, and away from the very dogmatic societies. Okay, you haven't done that, you haven't done, all these kind of things. When they are there, they are they fed off the shackles, they feel free, and that's what really the danger comes. So, um, they come to Malaysia relatively. I'm not saying that it is like Europe. It, it, it's not at all. It still, it's a very conservative society. But if you compare it to, say, for example, Saudi Arabia or to whatever society that's in the middle, I mean, in the Gulf, I think it's relatively a little bit more freedom. And it is that little bit more freedom that students, they take, use it, and this affects a lot the way they live in, in, in Malaysia. And uh, uh, they come, of course, for different reasons, jobs, business, economic or economic reasons, few asylum seekers. We, we, we have Sudanese asylum seekers there, but because Malaysia is not a signatory to, to neither, so they are quite few. They get problems there. The majority come to Malaysia for educational purposes. And then we have the youth or students, like my children, for example, and we have quite a good number uh, professors there. Uh, some of them, they, they, are, they were born there, they got educated, and even my children, they seldom visit Sudan. I mean, shame, I, I, I know that. But you could see how difficult it is, you know, if, especially if you have a big family to always shuttle them back to Sudan every few years. It's not an easy thing. Now, um, the empirical findings suggest that whatever category Sudanese youth uh, come to Malaysia, as I mentioned before, they share more or less the same problems. The, these are the, I, I tried to list some of the social legal problems facing Sudanese youth in Malaysia. Um, some of these problems, they are their own making. Some of them is made for them. So you could see that I don't know how to, to, to make you wake up if you are getting to, I mean, it's a little bit uh, boring, but uh, let's give you a story just a, a, a second. Now, um, some of them, these are the kind of things that are, um, they are so careless and they don't care about the law and they go and drive and they, by driving without licensing, and I think Professor Sadiq is here, I mean, all these problems, I think you could you comment on that. Uh, they commit very, very fatal accidents. And the Malaysians, you know, they are, I don't want to say that they are very British, but they are still following the British steps. They are very law-abiding citizens, citizen, relatively, of course. Now, um, the, one of the things that we have, can you imagine we have a lot of this prostitution going on, male and female Sudanese students, or youth, they go to this. And you know what takes them there? It's because of the need. Some of them, they are pushed to it. Some of them, they are pushed to this. Some of them, they find themselves, they don't have any other choice but to sell themselves. This is really very sad. Did I spend 20 minutes now? Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm really sorry. That's the, okay, let me, let me rush then. Yeah, okay, 
we, we, we have forgeries, we have immigration offices, drug abuse, addiction, drug abuse. And this is a very interesting story. There was a, a, a gentleman with his son, he's a professor, and then they were talking about the, the problem of drug abuse. Then his son said, Dad, do you know every other Sudanese, they must have tasted or used drugs, else he must be a priest. Then his father asked him, and you, who are you? He said, of course I'm a priest. You know. <laughs> he said, of course I'm a priest. So, <laughs> so um, they have problems with the police, you know, and then uh, brutality, police brutality. This is very rampant, by the way, and extortion. I mean, sometimes, some of the problems that happens the police could easily plant in order to extort, you know, and, and this happens quite a lot there. And this is one of the things that Sudanese, they, they suffer from it. And then some of them, because they need, they do, they act like drug mules and prostitutions. Pressure becomes intense that they are driven to, to the verge of psychological breakdown. Others commit suicide. And I think, Prasad, you remember, just during the eight, we had the Sudanese students who committed suicide. So we have quite a good number of these. Uh, conceptual background, you don't need it. Methodology, actually, um, as I mentioned before, questionnaires, and then social media. And mostly, I, these are the people that uh, we, we, we use. And then it's terrible. Once you are pressed with time, you don't know what to say and how to say it. You know, uh, these are the democratic, uh, demographic profiles we did all that, this you could see, uh, gender. Amazingly, you know, the female ladies, they outnumber the males. Can you imagine that? Oh, that's very interesting, you know. So uh, uh, we have, and then uh, analysis and findings, agreed that they enjoy their stay there, agreed that they easily adapt to Malaysian culture. But then if you go, these are those who responded through questionnaires. But then when I found that the, the, the number is not enough, I went myself and tried to interview. The actual, you will find that the reality doesn't represent whatever that response is that came from the students there. So um, they are not happy to tell you the truth. They are not happy. Uh, one of these things that is very common a sadiq to be called a Negro in Malaysia. I, I mean, we are all Negroes. I, I don't mind to be called a Negro. But then sometimes when they call you for a certain, I mean, they, they have certain uh, meanings after that, this is where. Or they call you Orang Hitam. Orang Hitam is a black person. I mean, so, so uh, even professors, I remember, to tell you the truth, in one of the Senate meetings. Yeah, indeed, there was a Professor Hassan Ibrahim, he was with me, and there was another professor from Kenya, and myself, we were three of us, and then, yeah, three of us, and then we were arguing, actually. I mean, this, there was something very interesting, and we were very much involved, to the extent that, actually, Professor Hassan and I, we were arguing. Then this lady, she's a professor of English. She did her master's and, and PhD here. She said, look at this Oran Haitam, they are taking the floor, and they are discussing. So it is, it's, it's, it's very sad that we heard and it is from professor, you know. And this is very common there. Okay, conclusion. There is an illusion, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, that Malaysia is, is, is a wonderful, it is wonderful, but it's not heaven on earth. This is, this is one of the things that. Some of the issues that we uh, come across by the Sudanese, it can be generalized throughout the African. I mean, uh, whatever most of the people, they say, I feel as if they are talking about our uh, uh, Sudanese problems in, in Malaysia. The globalized world, social integration is a key determinant to, harmonize, to harmonious existence. It is therefore recommended that Sudanese community leaders and the students should operate and should cooperate with the local authorities to improve reciprocal harmony and tolerance between host communities. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs>